All right, it's lesson 15. We're going to talk about the Zeeman effect and, uh, in other words, degenerate perturbation theory. And uh, before we get into that, it turns out it gets to be kind of technical and a little bit complicated. And in order to be more clear, I thought it might be useful to, to address a problem, I I'll call it a toy problem, that has um, some of the same features, but uh, is a little easier to grasp what's going on. Now you may remember last semester I had a similar toy problem where we had two different basis sets and we were expanding various kets in terms of one basis or the other basis and looking at operators and how they uh, looked in one basis or a different basis. And that's kind of the game we're playing here. Um, I have two sets of basis vectors, the A basis with A plus and A minus, and the B basis with B plus and B minus. And the notion is that uh, we have two different Hamiltonians. We have the original Hamiltonian, which we solve, and we discover that the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of that Hamiltonian are most simply expressed in the A basis. In fact, A plus and A minus could be eigenvectors of the original Hamiltonian. And then there's a perturbed, there's a perturbation to that Hamiltonian, but the perturbation has a different set of eigenvectors and eigenvalues, and those are most simply expressed in the B basis. So B plus and B minus, for example, could be eigenvectors of this perturbation. And uh, so let's think about that. Let's say we have uh, a, a Hamiltonian A, which has eigenvectors A plus and A minus, and eigenvalues plus big A and minus big A. And at the same time, there's a Hamiltonian HB, which has eigenvectors B plus and B minus, which are distinct from uh, Hamiltonian A, and uh, it has eigenvalues. Those eigenvectors have eigenvalues plus capital B and minus capital B. And the, the idea here is to say, well, what happens if I have a um, a Hamiltonian, which is the superposition of those two, uh, the A Hamiltonian and the B Hamiltonian. Now, understand there's no reason why, for example, capital A could be zero. If capital A is zero, that means that the eigenvalue of those two uh, basis vectors, A plus and A minus, is degenerate. That A is, if A is zero, then they have the same eigenvalue, zero, in other words. Um, I can always add or subtract a constant to a Hamiltonian so that even if I have uh, two energy states that are degenerate but have uh, non-zero energy, I can always add or subtract whatever that energy is to make them zero eigenvectors. So this is not all that, I mean, it doesn't seem general at first, but it's not that it's not that ungeneral. It's not that specific. So um, anyway, the total Hamiltonian is going to be the superposition of the A part and the B part. And gamma is going to represent some kind of a variable strength so that I can turn on HB. I can make it as strong as I like by making gamma a big number. If I want to turn off that uh, perturbation, I can make gamma equal to zero. And you can see that the results of our uh, calculations are going to depend on gamma. Gamma is like a knob of a magnetic field generator in the laboratory or electric field generator in the laboratory, something. Okay, so um, the notion is that you can represent the A Hamiltonian as a matrix in the A basis. You can see it's quite simple because uh, the A basis is the eigenbasis, so that means it's diagonal in that basis. Uh, but what about HB? What about HB? So the idea is um, you can, you know that HB acting on A plus, that's the question we need to ask ourselves when we're trying to find the representation of HB in the A basis. I can, I can decipher that by rewriting A plus as a superposition of B vectors of the, in the B basis. So at the very beginning, we had the dictionary that told us how to go back and forth between the A basis and the B basis. 
and uh, and you can see that if I write out what a plus is in the b basis, then I can easily determine what happens because we know that b plus is an eigenvector of hb with an eigenvalue plus capital B, and b minus is an eigenvector of hb with an eigenvalue minus b. So immediately we get this result. If I want to recast that in terms of the a basis, I can simply use the same dictionary to express b plus and b minus. Um, in terms of a plus and a minus, it gets a little ugly, but notice you can pull the a plus terms together, you can pull the a minus terms together, and the thing simplifies quite a lot, and you can see that it ends up looking like this. Similarly, you can pull the same trick with a minus, and ultimately it turns out that a hb acting on a minus looks like this, and at this point, we can just read off the uh, A plus and A minus components and put them into a matrix, which tells us that HB expressed in the A basis ends up looking like this. So you see, for example, the A plus component of HB acting on A plus is one third, and the A minus component is minus two, the square root of two over three. Of course, all multiplied by capital B. But uh, you can see where this matrix comes from looking at those two lines above. So now, let's form the overall Hamiltonian as HA plus gamma times HB. And how does that turn out? HA is the diagonal matrix we just saw. HB is this more complicated looking thing. But if I throw it all together, I get this terrible monstrosity. OK, that is the total Hamiltonian. Hamiltonian um, in terms of gamma in matrix form expressed in the A basis. If I want to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix, all I have to do is uh, take the normal strategy of solving the eigenvalue problem. The eigenvalue problem is, of course, H acting on some arbitrary ket is equal to a number times the same ket. That immediately gives us this uh, characteristic equation, which says the determinant of this, ma this matrix, notice the minus lambda is on the diagonal, has to be 0. You plug that equation into your uh, favorite computer algebra system. At least that's what I did, because I'm lazy. And it came out with, uh, with this result. And uh, that tells us that there are two eigenvalues. And of course, I can plug those eigenvalues back into the original eigenvalue problem and, uh, and compute the eigenvectors. In the end, we get some eigenvectors that depend on gamma. As you can imagine, when gamma is equal to 0, the eigenvectors are just a plus and a minus. But as you dial gamma up, um, the eigenvectors approach b plus and b minus. So um, let's do a little demo now, and you can see how that goes. So here we have the eigenvectors. Let's scoot back a little bit. Uh, a plus and b, a, a plus and a minus. And uh, I'm going to turn on gamma, and you'll watch gamma go. Gamma is going to be just a proportional to time. And once gamma gets going, you'll notice that the eigenvalues, which are going to graph in this window, um, separate. And that the eigenvectors, which will display here, are going to rotate toward b plus and b minus. So let's do that. You can see that effect happening. As time goes on, the eigenvalues now become proportional to time, essentially. Um, and the eigenvectors now are re approaching asymptotically the eigenvectors b plus and b minus. And that's the way it works. Good. Now let's get back to business. We're going to go back to the Zeeman effect. Now we talked about the weak field Zeeman effect last time. Today I want to deal with the weak field and the strong field and everything in between. It gets a little complicated. First, let's start with the fine structure correction. Remember, the fine structure correction to the hydrogen atom only depends on J. So it makes sense that the fine structure Hamiltonian, that is the Hamiltonian that includes the fine structure corrections and the original Coulomb potential of the hydrogen atom, 
would be most simply expressed in a basis where j is well defined. In other words, in the j m sub j basis. And that's right. The Zeeman Hamiltonian, on the other hand, is more complicated. It's proportional to Lz plus 2 times Sz. Now remember the 2 in the Sz comes in from the fact that the spin angular momentum is related to the magnetic moment of the electron in the similar way as the orbital angular momentum is related to the orbital magnetic moment, but there's an extra factor of 2, and that comes from the Dirac equation and relativity and all that stuff, but, uh, but it is well known that the electron's magnetic moment is twice what you would expect, assuming that the electron was just a ball of charge spinning with some angular momentum, and uh, that is a purely relativistic effect. But let's as Griffiths does in the text, let's go ahead and consider the n equal 2 levels of hydrogen. And when n equals 2, we have a couple of different possibilities. We can either have L equals 0, and S is a half. We can have L equals 1, S can be a half, and, uh, and J could be a half. Or you could have L equals 1, S equals a half, and J is 3 halves. So the J is 3 halves case is the so-called extended and the J is one half case is the so-called jackknife configuration. Let's consider these three ways of having the system organized. Of course, if L equals zero, the only contribution to J is the spin. So that's quite easy. Uh, the states of well-defined J also happen to be states of well-defined L and states of well-defined S. So um, it makes it quite simple. In the extended case, there are four possibilities because j is three halves. So m sub j could be three halves, a half, minus a half, and minus three halves. Of course, in the jackknife configuration, j is only a half, so there's only two possibilities. m sub j is plus a half, or m sub j is minus a half. But in order to compute the Zeeman Hamiltonian in uh, the j basis, we need to know what the values of L, uh, m sub L and m sub S are, because those are the things, those are the LZ and SZ quantum numbers that tell us what the Zeeman effect is going to be, what, what is the energy associated with the Zeeman effect. So let's begin with the S states. Of course, uh, they're the easiest, because L is equal to zero, m sub L is equal to zero. The only thing we don't know is what's going on with S. Uh, of course, if j is j, if m sub j <coughs> is plus a half, then s m sub s has to be plus a half, and if m sub j is minus a half, m sub s has to be minus a half. So it's not very complicated. This is quite easy. Um, where it gets more interesting is when we go into the jack or the extended configuration, where now we have to express. Uh, three halves, three halves in terms of L and S. Of course, the only way to get an M sub J of three halves is if M sub L and M sub S are both positive. So M sub L has to be plus one, M sub S has to be plus a half, so they can add up to three halves. And there's no other combination of M sub L and M sub S that does that. So that's sometimes referred to as the top of the ladder. Okay, we're all, we're all the way at the top. But the question is, how do I form an m sub j is 1 half out of various L and S states? The answer to that question, or in order to answer that question, you really have only two options. You can either go and grab the dreaded Klepsch-Gordon coefficient table, uh, or you can remember last semester we did this once before, and I kind of walked you through it. But basically the idea is you pull out the j minus operator. If you apply the J minus operator to uh, a state J is 3 halves, M sub J is 3 halves, you're going to get something proportional to J is 3 halves, M sub J is 1 half. In other words, it's going to bump the M sub J down by 1. And there's going to be a factor out in front. You remember that crazy square root thing that's out in front? But the basic idea is that J minus takes M sub J down by 1. But remember that J minus can be expressed as L minus plus S minus because um, J is L plus S. And, uh, 
And that means that I can operate on the state 3 halves, 3 halves with L minus plus S minus to figure out what I get. And the answer is, of course, when L minus acts on that state, you get 1, 0, but it doesn't touch the spin part. And when S minus acts on that state, you get 1 half minus a half, but it doesn't touch the L part. So when you add those two together, you get two pieces. One piece has 1, 0, a half plus a half. The other piece has 1, 1, left the L alone, but 1 half minus a half. So you end up with a superposition of two different states of L and S. That's why the JM states don't always have well-defined contributions. They don't have well-defined values of L, M sub L, and M sub S. If you measured M sub S in this state, you'd have a 67% chance, roughly, a two-thirds chance of getting plus a half and a one-third chance of getting minus a half. And similarly, if you measured M sub L, you'd have a two-thirds chance of getting zero. You'd have a one-third chance of getting one. And the crazy square roots in the front arise from those crazy square roots that show up in the front of the results of the L minus, S minus, and J minus operators that you remember, I'm sure, from chapter four. If you don't, you might go back and remind yourself how that goes. But that's the idea. So we can replace, or we can express, three halves a half as a superposition of states of different M sub L and M sub S. We can play the same game with 3 halves minus a half and the same game with 3 halves minus 3 halves. It should be no shock that the 3 halves minus 3 halves is simple again, just like the 3 halves plus 3 halves, because there's only one combination of M sub L and M sub S that give rise to that M sub J. Okay, I know this is technical and it's complicated, but what can I do? It's the way nature works. And in the jackknife configuration, it's a similar idea. It's just that now we need a different combination of M sub L and M sub S that adds up to a half, but it has to be orthogonal to the combination where that had J is three halves. And if you think about it for a little bit, you'll see that the only combination that does that has to have different signs on the two terms and the square root of one-third and the square root of two-thirds have to swap places so that when you dot those guys into each other, you get zero. And then you can use J minus to get the one-half minus one-half version, the J equals one-half, M sub J is minus a half version of the same ket, and you end up with this. And so let's summarize what we've got here. We'll write down every single one of these guys this is the order that Griffiths puts them in, for a reason that we'll get to in a second. Um, basically, the first four kets are top of the ladder, bottom of the ladder kets. So they are interesting in that they are simultaneously eigenvectors of J, L, and S. And they have well-defined values of J, M sub J, L, M sub L, and S, M sub S. So these guys are simultaneous eigenvectors of both the fine structure Hamiltonian and the Zeeman Hamiltonian. So there's no ambiguity about these four states. We don't need to, do, in fact, we're done. We can basically write down the answer for all four of them. The trouble comes in five and six and seven and eight. And the way these are grouped, uh, I want you to look at them for a second and notice that uh, the grouping has to do with the fact that they interact with one another they have the same values of M sub J. And so um, these guys, through the action of the Zeeman Hamiltonian, they connect to one another. In other words, the Zeeman Hamiltonian uh, has a non-zero inner product between five and, or matrix element between five and six, and a non-zero matrix element between seven and eight. But they're the only ones that connect. In other words, 5 doesn't connect with 7 or 8 or 1 or 2 or 3 or 4. 6 doesn't connect with 7 or 8 or 1 or 2 or 3 or 4, but it does connect to 5. So, um, and we'll see why that's important here in a moment. Let's review for a second what's going on. Uh, now, the fine structure Hamiltonian is diagonal in the J basis. We've already figured that out. And uh, we know that... Uh, the energy that we need to use in our expressions for energy is the two, the two state. We're, we're dealing with the n equal two state. 
And so I, I know that, and let's see what else I know. I can go ahead and compute the, uh, the fine structure Hamiltonian by uh, putting in the fact that E2 is E1 over 4, square it. That gives us a 32 downstairs because it's 2 times 16. And, uh, and I know n is equal to 2, so I can replace the n in this generic expression with a, uh, 2 and get 8 over j plus 1. Now, <clears throat> since it only depends on j, and we only have two values of j, we have j as a half and j as three halves, we can compute these guys directly. Um, putting in what uh, the actual energy is, we can see that uh, the fine structure Hamiltonian has basically two values. When j is a half, it works out to be minus 5 times the fine structure constant divided by h squared times 13.6 electron volts. We're going to call that gamma. So I don't have to say that so many times. And when j is 3 halves, it's minus gamma. So j is 1 half is minus 5 gamma. j is 3 halves is minus 1 gamma. So that's the plan. Uh, this is important because we're going to be making this nasty matrix and we want to simplify it as much as we can. So by taking all those constants and just calling them gamma, it'll look a little less uh, formidable. Okay, now let's remind ourselves about the Zeeman Hamiltonian. It's diagonal in the LS basis. And uh, the point is, if we apply, for example, the Zeeman Hamiltonian to some particular state, let's say the 0, 0, 1 half, 1 half state, the L comes in with the 0, the S comes in with the half, and so we get um, a half times 2 times the junk on the left. Uh, and then there's an H bar. The H bar comes from the SZ. Uh, because S is E is H bar times uh, M sub S. And so you end up with this junk out in front, but to simplify the thing, we're going to call that junk out in front beta. So beta is going to be H bar E over 2M times the external magnetic field strength. And so it's proportional to the magnetic field strength, but it, uh, and it's got units of energy, essentially. Okay, so since we know that the first four states are eigenstates of both the Zeeman and the fine structure Hamiltonian, we can immediately compute the matrix elements of Hz uh, on those states. They're, they're on the diagonal and they're all proportional to beta. Now, what happens when you apply Hz to one of these other superposition states? Well, it gets complicated. Well, if take psi uh, 5, for example. Psi 5, uh, the first component has m sub l of 0 and m sub s of a half. So that gives you uh, m sub l plus 2 m sub s is 1. But the second component has m sub l of 1 and m sub s of minus a half. So that gives you uh, m sub l plus 2 m sub s of 0. So these guys are not, neither of these are... Um, let me say it this way. This ket, psi 5, is not an eigenvector of the Zeeman Hamiltonian. The first component is an eigenvector. It's got an eigenvalue of 1 uh, times some junk. And the second term has an eigenvalue of 0. But uh, neither of them directly are, uh, or I should say the superposition is definitely not an eigenvalue. Because the second term gets wiped out. The first term um, survives. And so what you see is that Hz acting on psi 5 only has the first term in the answer. That means that uh, if I take psi 6, remember psi 6 was a superposition of the same two kets with different... Uh, no, I'm lying. No, no, I'm not lying. It's a superposition of the same two kets uh, with different coefficients. And um, that means that psi 6 has a matrix element on Hz acting on psi 5. This is what I meant by the fact that psi 5 and psi 6 are connected together by the Zeeman Hamiltonian. They have a non-zero matrix element, and if you calculate the complex conjugate, of course it's a real matrix element, so the complex conjugate is equal. And so if you plug all that in, you'll notice that uh, 
Psi 5 and Psi 6 have non-off-diagonal matrix elements. Psi 7 and Psi 8 have off-diagonal matrix elements, and those arise from the Zeeman Hamiltonian and uh, in more or less the same way. Now, what you, the good news is, because these are just little 2 by 2 off-diagonal elements, you can pull that uh, sub-matrix out and treat it as a little system, the Psi 5, 6. And so what we know are the, so you could think of Psi 5 and Psi 6 as sort of like A plus and A minus in our toy problem. And you could think of uh, the components of Psi 5 and Psi 6, the co components that have definite values of M sub L and M sub S. Those are a little bit like the B uh, eigenvectors in our toy problem. And the beta is a little bit like the gamma <laughs> from the toy problem. I picked unfortunate Greek letters, but the point is beta is just a parameter. It's proportional to the magnetic field strength. It has units of energy, but it basically tells you how strong the magnetic field is. So as you adjust the magnetic field strength, um, the, uh, the eigenvectors are going to transform from eigenvectors of HFS to eigenvectors of HZ. That's the idea. If, but the, the strategy is the same. You basically uh, treat this as a little eigenvalue problem. You put in the lambdas, just like we did in our toy problem. You get out energies, which are eigenenergies of the total Hamiltonian, the original and the new. And, uh, and then you can go back and compute eigenvectors at the same time by putting these lambdas back into the original eigenvalue equation. Let's take a look at this uh, result and see if we see anything interesting. Um, I'm going to rearrange things just a little bit, and then let's look at the case when beta is much, much less than gamma. If beta is much, much less than gamma, being careful with the square root. If you factor the um, 4 gamma squared out of the square root, you get the 1 plus something small inside the square root. You can uh, treat that as 1 plus something small over 2. Uh, if you use the expansion formula, the, tr you know, the small parameter expansion formula for square roots, and you get this result that um, the energy of the 5, 6 states, there are two of them, one of them has um, negative 3 gamma plus 2 gamma. Notice that's minus 1 gamma, so that means this must be uh, a j is 3 halves state, and uh, what is the beta going to be for that one? I got plus beta over 2, and then I get plus beta over 6, so that's going to be 2 thirds of beta. And so uh, this one must be one that goes, depends on beta, like plus 2 thirds. Now if you go back and look at the lesson last time, you'll notice that the low field energy for the Zeeman effect had, it was proportional to m sub j. It had this Lande factor, g sub j, in it, and it had the uh, magnetic field and the uh, Bohr magneton and all that stuff. But the, the main point is that you ended up with something proportional to beta as the energy. And if you go back and check it, you'll see that in this case, if j is 3 halves, uh, and um, l is equal to 1, then the factor in front of the beta turns out to be 2 thirds. So that, it's, it's useful to go back and check that this thing actually works out and, and you should feel confident, or at least you should go check it, and then you'll feel confident that it, that it does. And the, uh, what about if beta is very large? <coughs> Again, being careful with the square roots. Um, you see that in this case, uh, there are two possibilities. The plus sign gives you a plus beta. <coughs> Excuse me. The minus sign gives you zero. So the two states, 5 and 6, one of them uh, goes like plus beta for large b for large beta, and one goes like zero. And I think we already saw that when we were going through the states originally. So you can do a similar thing with uh, 7 and 8. You can look at the low field behavior. You can look at the high field behavior. But... Uh, and again, you can go back and check that they have reasonable, uh, reasonable properties, but, uh, but that's the idea. Just to remind you how it goes, there's the expression from, last, from the last set of slides, 
and there is the Lande factor. And uh, if you go and put in the L and Js for the different cases that we're studying, we have three Lande factors to worry about. There's the uh, S states, L equals 0, have G sub J equals 2. Then we've got the jackknife configuration has g sub j is two-thirds, and the extended configuration has g sub j is four-thirds. If you uh, put all that in, you end up with, um, so for example, states one and two, you end up with uh, minus five gamma plus or minus beta. Um, the j equals one-half states, remember, have a low field energy of minus five gamma, and uh, putting in the Lande factor, you get plus or minus beta. If you're looking at the extended configuration in the case where uh, j is 3 halves and m sub j is 3 halves, then you get minus gamma, that's the 3 halves j, has a higher low field energy, minus gamma, and then the magnetic field part goes like plus or minus twice beta. The, more, the trickier ones are the 5-7, and the 6, 8, and those guys also go um, like 2 thirds and 1 third beta, and that comes out of the Lande factor and all that stuff. So this is just to help you if you want to sit down and work it all out, you can check to see that the low field results of the eigenvalue problem produce the same results we got when we treated it as a weak field perturbation of the fine structure. And uh, just to kind of show how that works. I'm going to do a little demo now so you can see it for yourself. Okay, so here I've actually put into Grapher uh, the four energy eigenvalues that we got out of the, the uh, math. And I've, uh, in order to make it easier to zoom in and out, I've uh, added basically something like two and a half, uh, actually I have what have I added? I've added three, I think. I've added three uh, gamma to the energies so that the high energy state becomes plus two on this scale and the low energy state becomes minus two. Remember originally they were minus one and minus five, but if I uh, zoom in, the origin's gonna be way up there somewhere and it, it's not as pretty. So, but these are the high energy states. Remember the high energy states where the J is three halves and uh, the lower energy states where J is a half. And so these are the high energy and the low energy. Now there's only one source of J is three halves. That was when L is one, S is one in the extended configuration. But there's two ways to make J is minus, a, or J is a half. You can either have L equals zero, or you could have L equals one and S equals a half in the jackknife configuration. So both of those are in here. And we just worked through the math to see how that turns out. What I, what I want to show you, and this is the magnetic field direction to the right. You increase the magnetic field strength and the energies separate. And notice the energies even cross down here. Um, what happens if I zoom out? So let's zoom out. And you'll notice something interesting. These guys kind of pair up in a way. So now we're starting to look at the high field. Notice. Uh, the J is three halves and J is one half states sort of come together and what we end up with if you look out here a little ways is five states. I'll zoom out again. It looks like there's only five states out here. Now they're actually combinations of states of different J. States of different J are coming together to make states of definite L and S. So this is the high field limit. I can even zoom out some more. This is the high field limit and uh, in the high field limit, all that matters is m sub s and m sub l. The j doesn't make any difference anymore. Uh, we're looking at a different basis. It's sort of like in the toy problem, now we're in the b basis. The b basis is the ls basis instead of the j basis. And um, in this case, remember the energy went like, it was proportional to l sub z plus twice uh, s sub z. So you know, S sub Z is only plus and minus a half H bar. L sub Z is plus or minus, uh, ze minus one, zero, or plus one. But when you multiply the S sub Z by two, then it contributes either plus one or minus one. And so you end up with five states. You could have uh, L and S both, both 
positive, in which case you get uh, essentially two ones. You get a one from the S and a one from the L. You could have uh, L equals zero and S is plus one. Um, you could have L equals plus one, S equals minus one. N not S equals minus one, but S contributes minus one because of the factor of two, and so on. So it turns out there's five states, and those are the five states in the strong field Zeeman limit. But in the weak field limit, you end up with two groups of four. The S, the J is three halves, and the J is one half, and uh, it's a com more or less completely different behavior. But the uh, theory that we just worked through handles both the weak field and the, the high field limit. And that's how it works.